Hello everyone, this is Daniel Perez with eMate. So today's web workshop is going to be ad advanced form design in eMate X4. So we hold a web workshop every month. So just a few housekeeping items before we start. The session is going to be recorded. Um, everyone's phone is going to be muted, but you can type questions in at any time. And at the end of the web workshop, we're going to be covering those questions. So here are the topics we're going to be covering today. So the first topic is going to be form design and introduction. So we want to get some of the basics of form design so you can understand what one we go over to the advanced form design. And we're also going to be covering some form design best practices. So um, just some of the things that you should keep in mind when you're designing your forms. Also, we're going to be looking at some configurations. So we're going to be looking at advanced lookups and advanced field property configurations. So we're going to start off with an introduction to forms. So this is what a form is going to look like in its design mode. So Forms allow you to categorize and separate records within the same table. So say, for example, you have a asset and you may have different fields that relate to that asset, but only relate to that one specific asset. And it could be a type of asset. So you could have a HVAC unit where um, the sort of fields that you have are just generic, but then you have a a well that has very specific fields that you need to monitor um, and you need to have on the form. But your HVAC unit wouldn't be um, wouldn't really be relevant with those fields. So you can create two forms, one for your wells and then one for your HVAC units, or just one, one that's a default and then one that's specific to your wells. So you can separate the fields that display inside of each form. So here are the different field types that we have. So we allow text fields, we allow multi-line text fields, which allow you to have un a unlimited amount of characters. Uh, we also have numeric fields um, as well as logical fields. So logical fields are true false fields and you can use those for check boxes. And we also have date fields and date time fields. So these are going to help you store your dates. And we also have label fields, which will just give you um, a label on, on the form, and they don't actually store any information. So let's start off with some of the form basics. So I'm going to head over to my account here. And I'm currently inside of the work orders table. So as you can see, I have a form that's set up with two columns um, going, going down here. And I have a couple of forms set up inside this account. Right now, I only have two. I have the default form and I have the mobile form. So our mobile form, um, if I swap that to that form, you can see that I have much less fields showing in here. And the reason for that is because when you're looking at a mobile device, you're going to be looking at it um, just one column and you're going to be um, wanting to see much less fields because you're typically going to be on the go and you're going to want to do it fast. So those are some of the things to keep in mind when you're designing your forms. And I'm going to show you how to create your own form. So let's head over to our shortcuts menu and you can hit your shortcuts menu by clicking on your name, which should be in the top left of your account. And then you can click on manage forms. And so inside here on the left hand side is going to display all the available tables that we have. So we're going to want to select our work orders. So I type that in and work orders has appeared. So here it's going to let you know all the available forms that you have to edit. So I'm going to select our default. 
And so our default form is that form that we're currently looking at right here that has the two columns. And we're going to create a new form. So we're going to hit copy form. And the reason why we're going to copy is because this is going to give us all the current fields that we have inside of our um, current default. So that way we don't have to go through a process of adding and removing a lot of fields. So for the form ID, we're going to call this WO copy. And we're going to say copy of the default. And it already has copy from form default. So we're going to hit save and configure. And so now I'm going to select that form and hit edit form. As you can see, it's an exact copy of the form that we had for our default. So from here, we can add and remove fields. So currently, every, every field here is a field that we already have added. So if we select the trash can, it's going to remove that field. So first, I'm going to show you how to create a brand new field. Typically, the order you would go in is that you would search through these existing fields here to see if that field already exists. And then you would go ahead and create it if it doesn't exist. But in this instance, we're going to start off by creating this field. So um, for our field name, we're going to call this MANU date. And we're going to say that this is going to be a manufacturer date. And also, let me go ahead and create this in a different form. I'm going to close out of here real quick and then head over to our assets instead of our work orders. So I'm going to click on Manage Forms again. And I'm going to search for Assets and select our default. And I'm going to select our folder here. And so we're going to start again. So MAU date. And we're going to call it manufacturer date. And so for date fields, we're going to select the type of date. And we're going to set our maximum number of characters to eight. And we'll have zero decimals. And we will create the field and hit close. So there's our manufacturer date. So if we head over to an asset now, you can see we have this field manufacturer date now. And we can click on that and select a date in here and save. So it's very handy. Um, to be able to create fields, but most of the time these fields are already going to exist. So uh, be sure to keep that in mind before you create a new field. So I'm going to show you that here. So I'm going to hit this remove. And so clicking on the remove does not actually delete a field. So the fields are that you create are inside the account permanently. So if I select this folder, I can search through here for our manufacturer date, and there it is. And I'll select that and just hit select field. And there now we have the manufacturer date back, back added into the form. So I'm going to go to some of our best practices now. So. So some of the best practices that I'm going to be covering are best practices for um, creating fields, such as um, when to create a related table. So um, another best practice that we're going to be looking at is lookups. So when best to create uh, drill down lookups. So drill down lookups, we're going to be covering a lot more in the advanced section. So over here, I'm going to head over to the um, form design again. 
So I'm going to select Manage Forms. And I'm going to bring you over to Work Orders this time. And I'm going to select our default. And so inside here, we have a document field. Say, for example, you ran into a situation where um, inside your work order, you need to show a lot of documents. You may end up having to show six documents, um, six photos of you know, the work that's being done on this work order. Um, so it may be tempting to create six fields inside of your work order. So document one, document two, document three, document four, and so on. But the best way to handle this is to have a related table instead. And the reason for that is because inside of your related table, you can have as many um, records for a document as you'd like, and it doesn't take any space on the actual form itself. And then when you print out the work order, it will show that document um, on the printout. So with that in mind, um, we already have a work order documents related table that's set up inside of um, most accounts. So if I head over to related tables um, and head over to work orders first and then head over to related tables, we have this work order documents field. And if we hit add new record here, we can select a document. Give me one moment. And so inside here, we can select our document. And we would have a document showing inside of our work order documents. And then when we print out our documents, we can have that um, displaying at the bottom of the work order. Instead of having to put a you know, cumbersome form where we have a bunch of photos showing inside here um, for all these fields. And especially when you don't have those fields um, requiring anything inside them and they're just sitting there taking up space. So something good to keep in mind. Also, um, you may have a situation where you want to um, show, for example, a history or something along those lines, or there's something where you can't necessarily store that in just one single field and it's going to be constantly changing, you may want to store it inside of a related table instead. Um, for example, in our assets, say we had a location that was always changing inside of the asset. Instead of having a location field inside of our asset where we stored, it was here, now it's here, now it's here, we can have a related table instead that we can call our location. So let's go ahead and go to our assets related table and our, our assets form and create a new related table. So we're going to click on assets here, select our default and hit edit form. And from the key field, we're going to select edit field. And so the key field for assets is asset ID. So when you are inside of the key field, you're going to have a option to create related table. And so once I select that, I get this little pop-up and it's gonna ask me what I want to name the field or the related table. So I'm just gonna call this location history. And I'll click create related table. And it can, you can see it says operation succeeded. And now if I head over to my assets and refresh,
and I go to Manage Related Tables, I should now have a related table called Location History. So if I click this plus button here and hit Apply Changes, now I have a available related table where I can add the location for this asset and continually add um, new locations and possibly put a date timestamp. That way, every time I create this new location, you can see when these locations were changed and how long it's been inside of a location compared to another. So there's a lot of versatility when it comes to related tables. Um, and it's, it's a very handy tool um, to allow you to um, take up less, less um, of the front screen real estate when it comes to a uh, form. So now that we covered some of the best practices for the related tables and lookups, we, let's head over to our advanced some of our advanced sections. So we're going to start off with advanced lookups. So the very first kind of lookup that we're going to be covering is field mapping. And so field mapping is one of the most useful lookups, in my opinion, for the system. Because you can have a field map where you select one field and 10 fields automatically fill in just from selecting that one field. So it's very handy and it's a big time saver. So I'm gonna show you an example of how we can use the field mapping. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna exit out of here and head back into the system. So right now I have a photo inside of this asset and I also have a document field inside of my work orders. So what I want to do is I want to map that photo field to this document field. That way, whenever I add the asset to this work order, that document field or that photo field can transfer over to this document so I can know exactly what asset I'm working on. So to do that, I'm going to go back to manage forms and I'm going to search for work orders. And I'm going to select our default. And inside here, I'm going to go to our asset ID. So this is because our asset ID is the field that looks up to the asset table. And currently, we already have a field map on here. So our field maps are always lookups from tables. And so once you have selected lookup from table, you can select the lookup type, which will be a list view. And we can hit edit field map. And then on here, you're going to see this double column view. On your left hand side, we're going to have the table that we're pulling the data from. And on the right hand side, we have the date, the table we're pulling the data to. So the table we're pulling to is our work orders and the left hand side here in this case is going to be our assets so on here i'm going to select the asset photo so that would be image i believe or picture and on the right hand side i'm going to select document and i'm going to hit this plus button here now that i have um, the both of the fields that I want to map together. And so by clicking on that plus button, it's added it to the map. So it says that this field from assets equals this field inside of work orders. So I'm going to hit done. And I'm going to hit save. And I'll hit close and head back to our work orders. So I'm going to hit edit on this work order here. And I'm going to pick that asset. So let's see here. I know asset 106 has a photo inside of it. So I'll pick that one here and hit apply. And there you can see now our asset photo has transferred over from the assets 
and is now inside of our work orders. So when a user views this work order, he's going to immediately know which asset it's referring to. And we can hit save. And we have our saved work order. And all of that other information that was inside of the mapping also transferred over. So as you can see here, we have our asset description, our department, our site, our floor, our plant, all of that was also mapped inside of the asset and has transferred over into our work order. So um, asset um, lookups to with the list view or the list lookups are some of the most useful um, lookups we have. We also have a, another advanced lookup that's called a drill down. And so the drill down looks something like this. So our drill downs will have a hierarchy to them. So that way it funnels down what a user can see inside or what options a user can see inside of a dropdown. So I'll show you an example of one of those. So inside of our assets, I have set up a drill down for the asset type and asset subtype. So I'm going to hit edit on this asset. And so depending on what I pick in the asset type, it's going to filter down what I pick in the subtype. So let's pick vehicle, for example. And you can see here, the only options I get are car and truck. And that's because I picked vehicle. So if I pick HVAC unit instead, the options I'm going to get are duct-free split, hybrid, packed heating and split system. And so those are directly related to HVAC units. So these are some of the reasons why we use a drill down. Um, some of the things to keep in mind when you're using a drill down, however, are they have specific, specific places where they should be. Um, when you're using a drill down, be sure that if you're putting it inside of a work order that you don't also use work order requests. And the reason for this is because you want to make sure your data is as accurate as possible. Drill downs require accurate data. So for example, if I put something inside of my request and um, I just put some gibberish in there because I don't have um, something that's preventing someone from putting um, whatever they want inside of a field. And then it transfers over to the work order where we have a drill down. The drill down hierarchy is going to be inaccurate because the person inside of the work order request put inaccurate data. So it's best to have a drill down inside of the work order request if you're using it for the asset ID and um, not have it inside of the work order. That way, what data transfers over is what data transfers over. Um, and you can see all that data um, by referencing back to the work order request. So I'm going to show you how we create a drill down now. So I'm going to head over um, to manage forms again. And we're going to be creating this drill down for requests. So we're going to search for request. And here we have our work order requests. And I'm going to select our default. And inside here, we have our asset ID. So I want to set up a request on the uh, drill down on the request asset ID. That way, when the technician who may know less about the actual asset itself, or you know, maybe it's not a technician, maybe it's just a person who's on the floor and they notice that there's something wrong. You know, they might not even be the person who's doing the work. They're just requesting work to be done. They might not know exactly what that asset is. So they need a little bit of guidance to get to what that asset ID is. So in that situation, I think a drill down might be useful. So I'm going to go to lookup properties and here I'm going to select drill down lookup and it's going to ask you to define the drill down. So we're going to click define and we're going to get a pop up here. 
So the very first thing we select is our table. So we're going to select our asset table. So there it is. And we're going to populate our site field. So when you're creating a drill down, you want to start off by populating the um, the higher parts in the hierarchy and have it funneled down to the um, to the lower parts. And the lower part should be your asset ID. So we're going to start off with site. And we're going to select site here as well. And then we're going to add a new level. And inside here, we're going to select building. And we'll select building in here as well. And it's handy if your fields are all named the same thing. That way, you can easily um, determine um, what field should be matching which field. And I'll add a new level. And then I'm going to select our floor. And I'll select floor in here as well. And add another level. We're, we're going to add five levels on this one. So we're next going to pick our asset description. And we'll select that in both. And add one more level. And here we're going to select our asset ID, which is the last in our hierarchy. And then we're going to hit save. So drill downs have a maximum of five levels. So now that this is saved, we can hit X and hit save here and close. So now if we head over to our work order requests, you can see here we have um, our drill down. So let's hit add for a new one. And we're going to select um, Johnson City. And you can see here it gives me three options because that's I have three options inside of Johnson City. So we'll select main, our floor, we'll select ground. And we have a few inside, a few descriptions inside ground. So let's pick our HVAC unit split system. And then we have a few asset IDs inside here. So um, it's filtered down out of every asset ID inside of the system down to four assets. And then from there, I can pick the asset. So I'll pick um, 106. And then I would be able to finish out this request. And now we have our work order request, and we have all of our drill down filled out. So now that we've covered our drill downs, um, let's um, head over to our advanced field property configurations. So our field properties, um, we have a lot of different properties that we associate with fields um, that you may not notice behind the scenes. So for example, if we head over to a, a work order, we have some fields inside here that are set as required. So the reason why we have require, required fields is because we want a person to finish filling out these fields um, before the work order is saved or maybe even before the work order is closed. And these kind of fields will help make sure that your data is more accurate because if a person is required to fill out a field, um, then they've already gotten past the hurdle of being um, too lazy to put anything in there. And they, if, if they write gibberish, you're going to very clearly be able to see um, what they wrote. And you can go back to them and, and ask them why they wrote that. So inside of our forms, 
we're going to go to manage forms and we're going to be looking at work orders again and back to the default so i'm going to just select a field here so i'm going to select um, our assigned to and click on the properties for that and you can see here we have our required field and so it says this field cannot be empty and it has a little checkbox so if we wanted our assigned to to always be required then we can hit save here or we can hit that checkbox and then save and we can also make this a read only field and so by making this a read only field you're going to force a user to look uh, to use a lookup um, and that is only if you have a lookup on there you may have a circumstance where you don't want a user to actually create anything or to fill anything into this field um, not specifically with a assigned to but you may have like this field over here that's called number of edits so this field gets altered by a workflow every single time a user edits a work order so by having this a field that um, cannot be altered someone can't go and mess with the data afterwards that way um, they can't go edit and say well i i feel like i didn't mean to edit that that time let me just change it to five edits instead of six so that way your data is protected um, if it's triggered by a back-end um, back fun function so we also have another kind of field that's called a hidden field. And so a hidden field does not display on the form. And the purpose for this is that we can prevent a user from seeing what is actually inside of this field. And so some of these fields, um, for example, the assign ID is a hidden field. So the assign ID, is a field that's associated with the assigned to and this field is hidden because it's not necessary for a user to see it so this field is automatically populated in by the lookup for the assigned to so if i were to head over to our work orders list view and i were to go to manage table columns and i wanted to view our assign ID. I'll just go ahead and add that. You can see here that we have this assign ID field filled in for um, all of these work orders. Even though it is on the form, you just can't see it. So this is useful for fields that you may want to report on um, and you will have them filled in automatically via workflow. You can have them hidden. That way, no one can mess with it. No one, no one has to bother looking at it. It doesn't clutter up your form. And you can report on it later. So back to here, we're going to be looking at a, another configuration. So we have checkboxes. So inside the system, we allow checkboxes to be created for fields. Um, some of the purposes for checkbox fields. So checkbox fields are universal. Um, everyone understands a checkbox field. So it's very helpful to have them inside your system. They store true or false data. So whether the checkbox is blank, it's considered false. If the checkbox is checked, then it is considered true. So they can interact with a few um, different elements of the system. For example, you may want to have a checkbox field that um, plays a part with your asset downtime. So you could have a field inside of 
assets over here and let's go ahead and, and create one. So we'll head over to assets and we'll hit manage forms and we'll type in assets here and edit and we'll call this is asset we'll call this asset d and we'll name this is asset down and we will put this as one as the maximum character zero as the decimals and for the type we're going to select logical and hit create field. So now that we created this logical field, it's not quite a checkbox yet. So to make it a checkbox, we're going to hit edit. And then we can go to data dictionary. And we can go here. And inside here, this is the back end for this field. So be cautious when you're making changes inside here if you don't know um, what specifically you're intending to do. So inside here, we want to make this a checkbox. So we're going to hit edit. And where it says lookup, we're going to say true. And on the lookup type, we're going to type in checkbox in all caps and we're going to hit save and so now we're going to close this close this as well and if we open up this in a new tab you can see now we have a logic a logical checkbox field so we can check this box and we can know whether this asset is down um, it would also be useful inside of the work order. So say, for example, that a work order is going to, um, this work order is being performed because this asset is down. You may want to have the um, asset down field, a required field inside of the work order. That way, when you're creating this work, a work order, um, you have to select um, whether this asset is down or not. And so by doing that, you can go over to your asset and have something trigger inside your asset um, that says whether it's available for service. So um, there's a lot of configurations that can be um, done with that in mind. And so uh, let's head back to our slides here. So another configuration that we have is the closeout. So when you close out a work order, we have these fields here that will display. You can see here we have um, this section called closeout fields. Um, in this image, I have comments, labor charges, um, a cancel work order, a downtime, requires follow-up, and a supervisor signature. So inside my account right now, I don't have that downtime field. So let's go ahead and add that field. So from our, from our table here, we want to select data dictionary instead of going to forms because our downtime isn't actually on the form. So we're going to search for downtime. And to do that, we type work into our table name and our description. We're going to search for downtime. So this field in your account may um, just be called hours instead under the field name. So you can search for it there as well. And under the record type, we're going to type in F. That way we know that this is a field. So we're going to click into here and inside here we have um, our data dictionary um, back end 
So we're going to go to our field formatting and we're going to say, or we're going to type in here, close out. And now that we've typed close out in there, this is going to appear on the closeout form, but we may have some more use with um, some more things that we can do to this field to make it more useful. Um, so you may have a, depending on how your um, work orders are set up, you may always have downtime every time you have a work order. So if that were the case, then you may want to have your downtime as a required field. That way, when you create um, or when you close out the work order, it will require you to set this downtime before you can close it out. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to set this as a required field. And so we have this field here that's called cannot be left blank. So we're going to hit true. And we're going to save these changes. So now that we've saved these changes, if we head over to our work order, and let's go to an open work order, and let's hit close out. Oh, let me head back to the data dictionary for one moment. Oops, I put it into the wrong field here. Sorry about that. So this should be in the custom routine. Sorry about that, guys. So I'm going to head back to work orders. And over here, I'm going to hit close out. And there you can see now we have our downtime. So over here, if I were to try to close out this work order, and I know supervisor signature is also a required field, so I'm going to fill that in. If I try to close this out, you can see it says downtime cannot be left blank. So it won't let me close it out without filling in a downtime. That way your downtime can always be accurate. Your guys are always putting in a downtime as once they close out their work order. So we'll say asset was down for four hours and we'll close this work order. All right, so now that we covered our hidden fields, our downtime, and we've um, covered um, the closeout, we have another thing that we can do inside here that's called default values. So default values, are fields um, that are going to automatically populate. So once we set up a default value um, and we create a new form or uh, create a new um, record, you can see that things automatically populate, like our job status, our work order type, problem type, schedule date, and so on. So inside here, I'm going to show you how you can create your own default values. So let's go to manage forms and let's go to work orders and default. And so inside here, let's go to our schedule date. So inside here, um, as you can see from inside the work order, when I had added a new work order, it had put the current date plus three. So we have that set up inside of our default value here. Um, and our formatting is dollar sign, dollar sign, date, open parentheses, close parentheses, plus three, dollar sign, dollar sign to close it out. And so as mentioned, what this means is that this is the current date plus three. So 
depending on how your work orders are set up, you may want to have a schedule date that's seven days. So you could do that here. You can put seven days and then you can hit apply default value to all forms. And now when we go to our work orders and hit add, our schedule date is a default of seven days after we've created our work order. So there's another thing that you can do um, inside the default values. So you can just put um, random text inside there. So say for example, you wanted um, this to always be employee. So you can have employee inside here. That way your assigned to type will always be employee. And another thing you can do is you can put a, a log of who, um, of who was the person who created something. So with that, we have a function for um, who was the user who created it. And so let's create a field real quick. So we'll call this CRT by, and we'll say, created by, and we'll just keep it as a text field. And inside the field properties, we're going to put our dollar signs, so dollar sign, dollar sign. And this time we're gonna say LC, L-O-G-G-E-D, dollar sign, dollar sign. And we'll apply this default value to all forms and hit save. And now when I hit add, I'm gonna have that new field and it's gonna have my account name inside here. So my account name is DP Demo. So now you can see this was created by DP Demo. And if I'd like, I could have this a field that um, is read only. So we'll say here, cannot be altered. And then we'll head back to our work order and now inside here, this is a read-only field. Nobody can change this. That way, um, that data is secure. You know that it was DP Demo who created this work order. All right. So now that we covered all of our um, topics for today, I'd like to um, just briefly show you the upcoming webinars uh, before we move on to questions. So we have. Um, an upcoming webinar, September 12th. Uh, we also have a best practices webinar coming September 19th. And we have some upcoming boot camps coming up. So um, be sure to keep an eye out for the new user training webinar. That also happens once a week, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we are also having Accelerate this year. So Accelerate is happening November 13th through the 15th, and it's a great place to learn about the system and see all the cool things that are coming out. All right, so I wanna open the floor to questions, guys. So um, please type your questions into the chat and I'll go ahead and start answering them um, via the messaging system.